Sale of the Century, tonight at 11.30 on 7. Make it a family affair. Join the YMCA. Good evening. I'm Ted Koppel, and this is Nightline. If only the Allies knew, we said to one another. If only Roosevelt knew. If only Churchill knew. If only the Pope knew, the killer wouldn't kill. There is compelling, even overwhelming evidence that they did know, but that they did too little and much too late. That's our story tonight. This is ABC News Nightline. Reporting from Washington, Ted Koppel. The Holocaust? No, there has been nothing to match the scope of its brutality during the past 40 years. But considering how little attention we paid to the three million who died in Cambodia, to the slaughtered Igbo in Nigeria, to the war victims in Iran and Iraq and Afghanistan, and considering how long it took us to become even moderately interested in Ethiopia's famine, we should perhaps reserve judgment on those who failed to act or those who acted much too late to help the victims of the Holocaust during the early 1940s. It is not, as you will hear, that what they did was right, but that we, in so many ways, are still like them. Nightline correspondent Jed Duval spoke with the author of a new and extraordinary book. It is called The Abandonment of the Jews. The author is history professor David Wyman. By the dozens, by the hundreds, by the thousands, by the millions, they were marched to their deaths. The systematic murder of a people. David S. Wyman, a professor of history at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, says the United States knew about it, could have acted, and did not. The State Department was not interested in. They did not want to get involved in rescue. The State Department did not want pressure to bring Jews in here. One, because they didn't like Jews, they didn't like any Eastern Europeans. They were quite aware, and, I, and everything I've seen in the research indicates they were correct in this assessment, that if they took in even the full quotas, 60,000 a year, there would have been hell raised in Congress. The Congress was not inclined to large-scale immigration. And, to the extent that there was anti-Semitism in the Congress, it represented the country. We do have opinion polling, and it indicates high levels of anti-Semitism, probably the peak level in American history during the end of the 30s and into the war years. Those polls show that, that uh, American people considered Jews more of a danger than Germans and Japanese, during the, except for the one year of 42 when the beginning of the war was freshest in people's minds. President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, according to Wyman, failed on this issue, knew and turned away. Roosevelt and those in his administration knew by late 1942 that hundreds of thousands of Jews were being killed in organized fashion. Five American Jewish leaders came to see the president. As the Jewish leaders came in and handed him a document summarizing the information they had. He said, I know this, and I know it's as bad as or worse than what you think. One of the five Jewish leaders at the meeting with President Roosevelt was Adolf Held of the Jewish Labor Committee. His were the only authoritative notes of the session. They are preserved in the Labor Committee's archives. So there's an absolute point beyond which we're sure that Roosevelt was aware. He did not act. He was indifferent in response to it. In October of 1943, several hundred Orthodox rabbis came to Washington to try to make their plea for Europe's Jews directly to Roosevelt. They were told the president was too busy. I've seen his agenda for that day. It's available in the archives. He had a little business in the morning. The afternoon, which was when they planned to see him, 4 o'clock, wide open. And he left the White House about a half hour before these rabbis were to arrive. The rabbis held their own march, and it was reported in a few newspapers, mostly on inside pages. Indeed, inside is where newspapers of the day, including the leading papers, put news of the assembly line deaths. Only rarely was it front page news, even in Jewish-owned newspapers such as the New York Times and Washington Post. The American Jewish community was divided. A few leaders were active. Many others were inert, afraid of the issue as politically sensitive, unwilling to press. 
David Wyman found out all these things about the news media, about the government and Jewish leaders. But for him, the most terrible discovery was what the churches did not do. From the Christian churches, a thunderous silence. No denomination, Protestant or Catholic, made a, I took a clear statement, made a statement on this issue and said, this is wrong, this must stop. We must do whatever possible. So we hear about the failure of the Pope to speak out about it. It was not only the Pope. In our country, the leadership of the churches didn't take up the issue. David Wyman is the grandson of two ministers. That's what hurt me most as a Christian, and as a Christian who grew up in a Methodist church in that period, to, f to find out that my own people, the, those who were in the liberal uh, cutting edge of social-oriented Christianity in this country, failed and they failed badly on the issue. They had an important role to play in it, and they failed. When I wrote the chapter that dealt, began to deal with that, when I get into that in the fourth chapter, that for the first time, I think since I was an adult, I cried. It was to me, to be a male adult meant you did not cry. It was weakness. I learned, one thing I learned from this book, you must cry. There are times that people must cry, and that's what taught me that. I was very disturbed. I can remember sitting right there and writing that paragraph and I saw it and then when I saw what I had written I just stopped. When the rabbis who had come to Washington failed to see the president, when they had asked America for help and America turned away, the rabbis went to the Lincoln Memorial. They formed a group there and sang in Hebrew. They sang the Star Spangled Banner. Jed Duval for Nightline from Washington. Later in this broadcast, we'll hear from Elie Wiesel, poet, philosopher, and Auschwitz survivor, who this weekend returned to Auschwitz for the anniversary of its liberation 40 years ago. We'll also talk with an American who did help during World War II, John Paley, who served as executive director of the War Refugee Board. But first, when we return, we'll talk with the author of the book, The Abandonment of the Jews, Professor David Wyman of the University of Massachusetts. This is ABC News Nightline, brought to you by RCA. Who has taken complete control and placed it at your fingertips? RCA, with an amazing VCR that asks you what you want to record and when, in simple language, right on the screen of your TV. So, what you select on screen with this advanced remote control, you'll get on videotape. The world's first remote programmable VCR. Only from RCA. Technology that excites the senses. To the 140 million check writers in this country. Here's my check. Take note of this sign. When you see it any place, anywhere in the country or the world, Telecheck says your check is welcome. I have a check and uh, this out-of-state license? No card to carry, nothing to join. Just look for the red and white Telecheck sign. A sign for all 140 million of you. Your first check? Yeah. Is it okay? Make that 140 million and one. Telecheck says your check is welcome. You ought to lighten up. WMET has. I just call to say I love you. I am a woman in love. I love you just the way you are. Smile, baby. 95.5 WMET is going to make you happy. You'll be glad you met us. You're about to see an unusual race. Three European performance sedans against the all-new Toyota Cressida. Go get him, Jay. The Cressida is a luxury car with limousine-style comfort and features. And the new Cressida's independent suspension and electronically fuel-injected Twin Cam 6 fits right in with its European counterparts. The Toyota Cressida hits up with the best of them in every way but one. Price. Did we win, James? By about $15,000, sir. Oh, I'm Peter Jennings. Tomorrow on ABC's World News Tonight, dramatic new hope for people who have herpes. An over-the-counter pill, and the experts say it could stop the spread of the disease altogether. It was an extraordinary event. People from throughout the world gathered at Auschwitz, Poland this weekend to commemorate the 40th anniversary of the liberation of the Auschwitz death camp. A camp where in a space of five and a half years, some four million men, women, and children were systematically put to death. 
It is ironic in a sense that 40 years later, what happened at Auschwitz is receiving more attention in the outside world than it did at the time the murders were taking place. Joining us now live in our New York studios, David Wyman, professor of history at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. His book, The Abandonment of the Jews, documents that seeming indifference. Professor Wyman, let me try to postulate a reason for that indifference. There was a terrible war going on. There had to be other, even greater considerations to those who were running the war effort, who were concerned about the armies, who were concerned about quite literally the fate of mankind overall. Does that in any way explain to you what now seems like callousness and indifference? No, not really, because at the, of course, that was the overwhelming issue at the time, was the war, but there was room for other issues to be dealt with during the time. Let me throw simply one point in there. The United States and the British uh, were, were willing and able to move 100,000 non-Jewish Greeks, Poles, and Yugoslavs who were in some danger out of Europe and move them across the Mediterranean and set up camps for them and, to, and care for them in North Africa. Uh, all the problems that seemed to come to the forefront when, it, when the issue was getting Jews out evaporated in the face of that kind of effort. And to what do you primarily attribute that? We have heard mentioned anti-Semitism, at least in the mid-levels of the State Department, a real factor? Uh, uh, anti-Semitism was certainly a factor within the, within the State Department, but more importantly in Congress and in the, in the society as a whole. The, the State Department was not interested in, in bringing Jewish refugees into this country because of their own personal feelings in part, but I think much deeper than that was their, their concern that if they had moved, and prop, probably this was in part Roosevelt's concern, part of the reason that he hesitated to move, that the Congress would respond in a very negative way. You suggest in your book that President Roosevelt had a rather cynical attitude, politically speaking, that in a sense he took the Jewish vote for granted and didn't want to alienate the non-Jewish vote. What, how, much of a, how much of a factor do you think that was? Well, it was a factor certainly in Roosevelt's response because we find that he did move in, in January 1944 14 months, by the way, after the information had become available. There was a terrible loss of 14 months of opportunity to do what might be done before Roosevelt and the American government did move. But he did move in that situation, which would indica indicate that he, that he was responsive to the pressures when they could be put upon him. When we see, as we just did, those tiny little boxes on the inside page when Rabbi Stephen Wise came to Washington got confirmation of what his worst fears were, held a news conference, told newsmen that at least two million people had already died in the camps, and there it is, relegated to a little box on page 11, I think it was, of the New York Times, and I don't remember what page it was of the Washington Post. Why? That's a, that remains an enigma. Whether there was a fear that this was too sensationalistic and they might be, it might be found to be inaccurate, I don't know, but that doesn't hold up because uh, after the first reports, more reports came, even more horrible reports, and the evidence accumulated massively in early 1943. So there couldn't really have been any doubt about it. I, I never really have come to a final answer as to why that was lost in the papers in that fashion. And perhaps the greatest enigma of all, why do you think it was that the American Jewish community was not able to get together on this and speak with one voice. Because there are many differences in the American Jewish community as there are among any groups of people. It was very hard to pull together. Uh, it was an urgent situation, but somehow or other the divisiveness continued to be there. Let me say nonetheless, though, that it was the American Jewish community that did most of what was done in this country to deal with that issue. That well, most of the rest of the country failed utterly. The American Jews at least rose significantly to the occasion. They could have done more. We did ultimately establish a war refugee board in, in 1941, in, in 1944, in January, and there were some achievements made through that war refugee board. We're going to talk about precisely that in just a moment, because when we come back, we'll be joined by John Paley, who served as executive director of the war refugee board, the organization that was finally created by President Roosevelt in 1944 to try to rescue those slated for death by the Nazis. 
At some places that sell computer equipment, equipment is all you get. But Andre Computer Centers give you something extra. People who are with you every step of the way. Andre consultants and software experts who make sure you get what's best for your business. Andre instructors, installers, technicians. At Andre, you get more than leading brands of equipment and software. You get people who help you get the most out of it for as long as you own it. At Andre Computer Centers, we're with you every step of the way. The same size families are building the same size homes, but they're not making the same choices about the electricity they'll use. Let's get the efficient one. Let's get the green one. And making better electric choices in the beginning makes electricity an even better value in the end. Now both families are thrilled to be living in brand new homes. But for one of them, it's a cheaper thrill. Electricity, it's the power of choice. You run this whole department. With the help of a few other people. He was class president. He always thought big. Yeah. <laughs> a personal computer. Uh, actually, it's more than that, Dad. It's a tower. Tower? An NCR tower. It's faster and more powerful than a personal computer. And all my people can hook up to it. Smart. <laughs> like his father. And like his mother. The NCR Tower, when you need more than a personal computer. You... There's a whole new kind of Buick on the road today. You... Introducing the lean and agile Buick Somerset. A front-wheel drive coupe with electronic fuel injection and advanced digital instrumentation, all standard. And all sticker priced as low as 9034. See the all-new Buick Somerset at your Chicagoland Northern Indiana Better Buick dealer. Then ask yourself. Wouldn't you... Above the crowd, Remax Realtors. Did you know that on the average, your Remax Realtor outsells every competitor, including those who claim they're number one? Call Remax for the fast results you deserve. Buy or sell with the winners. It's the right move for you. Above the crowd, Remax Realtors. Joining us now live from our Washington bureau, John Paley, who was executive director of the U.S. War Refugee Board, formed in January of 1944. The board is credited with playing a crucial role in saving the lives of some 200,000 European Jews. But one has to ask, Mr. Paley, why did it take so long? Why was it only formed in January of 1944? Well, I'd say largely because uh, the public didn't seem to be ready for it. Uh, the State Department uh, actually suppressed information coming to the United States about the Holocaust, and there was a good deal of anti-Semitism involved. Even after the War Refugee Board was created, and after it had, as I recall, a presidential dictum that instructed the other parts of government, the War Department, the State Department, OSS, to cooperate, they did not fully cooperate, did they? I would say that from the time the War Refugee Board was uh, created by President Roosevelt's executive order, uh, we did get cooperation. Full cooperation? Uh, well, I wouldn't say that. I, uh, uh, the, the problem was so vast and so difficult to deal with in the midst of a war uh, that uh, there were times when uh, we had trouble. But we, we had a mandate. Uh, we had the right under the executive order to have our own representatives abroad. We had representatives in London. We had representatives in Spain and Turkey and Sweden. And uh, we were able to assist the private agencies uh, in rescue. Professor Wyman, from having read your book over the past couple of days, uh, you find considerable evidence that the cooperation was not all that forthcoming at times. That's my position. The executive order was very clear in indicating that all agencies of government were to assist the War Refugee Board to whatever extent needed, as long as it didn't interfere with the war effort. Now, in one immediate case that comes to mind is the request for bombing the gas chambers in, in, in Auschwitz and the rail lines leading to Auschwitz. The War Refugee Board made requests to the War Department that that be carefully considered. And what happened was that the War Department 
simply applied a policy, an internal policy, that they would not involve themselves in rescue. That policy they had initiated shortly after the War Refugee Board was formed. In other words, in defiance of the executive order, the War Department internally made a decision that they, that they would not participate in rescue. That they violated the whole approach. And so when, some months later, the request came into the War Department to consider the bombing of those lines in the gas chambers, they simply went into their files, pulled out a policy which said, we don't co cooperate in rescue, and turned around and gave the answer, no, this is impossible to do because it will divert air power that's essential for important targets elsewhere. You know, that was one of those arguments, Mr. Paley, that one hears again and again and again, and if you put yourself back into the psychology of, of the closing months of the Second World War, uh, there is a there is a, a a sense of reality that comes through when you hear people say we mustn't do anything that's going to divert from the war effort because ultimately by defeating the Axis powers that is the best thing we can do. Was that sometimes used as an excuse? Well, in the case of the bombing, uh, we finally did uh, ask the War Department to bomb Auschwitz. Uh, we were told by the War Department. Uh, that uh, this would involve bombers going from England and uh, that uh, spider, fighter escorts couldn't uh, go that distance. Could I interject there that the bombers that were going right up there at that time were coming from Italy? That they, is correct. Uh, you know, uh, uh, English-based bombers Mr. were Wyman, irrelevant. Mr. Wyman is entirely correct. We never learned until after the war that uh, they were bombing all around Auschwitz. That document that Mr. Paley refers to, I've analyzed very carefully in the book, and it's fraudulent. The, the reasons given for not being able to do it are false. That is correct. Then why, how do you, I mean, Mr. Paley, these, these men and women were your, were your colleagues. How do you explain that? What was the, what was the rationale then? If indeed there were, there were planes that, that had the range, and as I recall Mr. Wyman's book, during precisely the period, I think it was in, in August, Professor Wyman, was it not, of, of 1943? 44. 44, rather, during precisely that period, there were bombing raids that were being carried out within 20 or 30 miles of Auschwitz. Well, Auschwitz itself was struck on August 20th, the industrial facilities there. I, I can't explain that, Ted. Uh, I suppose the War Department felt, felt that uh, its job was to run the war and it didn't want to take on any other uh, duties. That's exactly but right. We, the we were, minutes show that. You, yes. You're quite correct on right. that. Mr. Paley, uh, let me ask you another but question. Let me underscore that that's in violation of the executive order, which carries the force of law when they made that decision that, that they were to fight a war and not, not assist in rescue. Isn't that correct? Uh, it said consistent with the war effort. And I think if somebody asked the War Department to have a raid uh, from the ocean, uh, onto the land to rescue people, uh, they could justifiably say this was interfering with the war effort. Correct, but if they had, if they had taken the trouble but, to but check... But bombing Auschwitz which was not in that category. Right. Let, me, let me just get another, an, another question into to, uh, Mr. Paley, Professor Wyman. During the time that the War Refugee Board was, was in effect, how many, how many Jewish refugees did you succeed in bringing to the United States? Uh, One thousand. And that was with great difficulty. We felt it was necessary that we bring some people here outside the quota because we were asking other countries to do this. And finally, we brought in a thousand people uh, at Camp Oswego in or uh, northern New York. Wasn't that ultimately, wouldn't you say, that was one of the factors that caused many of our allies to be able to say, look, you guys aren't doing it. Why should we? Wasn't that ultimately used as a justification? Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure. Yeah. Why, why was it so few? Why, well, why weren't you able uh, to get uh, more? Professor in? Wyman is correct that Congress was very opposed to uh, uh, immigration. Uh, labor didn't want uh, additional people brought in. Uh, there was a great deal of anti-Semitism. Uh, the, the mood of the country was not at all as it is now. Could I point out that when that thousand was brought in outside the quota, the U.S. quotas, immigration quotas, which would have permitted the, the entry of 60,000 refugees per year, were being used to the extent of only 10 percent. 6,000 came in in that year, and yet they had to make a special arrangement to bring 1,000 in around the quota, indicative of the State Department's unwillingness to cooperate in the whole procedure. All right, gentlemen, and I the thank The people you. in the War Refugee Board had to go to extreme lengths to get the president to allow that thousand to come in. That's Professor correct. Wyman, excuse me, I, I thank you so much for joining us, and Mr. Paley, I'm most appreciative that you came in.
When we come back, tonight's Insider segment, we'll hear from poet and philosopher Elie Wiesel, a death camp survivor who this past weekend returned to Auschwitz on the 40th anniversary of its liberation. Thanks a lot, Citibank. Ordinary Visa and MasterCards won't do. No, Citibank always has to be better. Just by using them, my son earns bonuses called City Dollars. They save him up to 40% on nice gifts. But does he get me a grandfather clock or a colored television? No, not my son. Come on, Mom, let's go! Come on, just a few more miles, Mom. Keep pedaling down that road. Visa and MasterCard from Citibank. It's the bank that makes them better. You probably can't guess where you can find all this under one roof. Probably not at the stereo store at the mall. Probably not at the TV shop. Or the computer center across town. You'll find all this at Sears. That's right. Sears. There's more for your life at Sears. Huh? Crap cut me. About your macaroni and cheese. Tell them, Annie. We think it should be called Kraft Cheese and Macaroni, because it tastes the cheesiest. what they say? They have to change them all your boxes. Kraft Macaroni and Cheese has more cheese than any other brand. That's why it tastes the best. There's one. A million boxes? I think we're going to need more crayons. Kraft Cheese and Macaroni, the cheesiest. Hey, it says here that monolithic conglomerate bought Smidgen Industries for $317 million. Hey, that's some news, huh? Yeah, and they paid $40 million too much. Huh? Where? It says monolithic CEO Jonathan Sigma's flamboyant ego got in Daily the way Daily papers can give you the news, but Crane's like Chicago business also gives you views. Stock price down. Well, what paper you read? Subscribe to get informed analysis and extra background you can use in your own business planning every week. I'm Steve Bell. And I'm Kathleen Sullivan. Begin your day informed with all the news, business, sports, and weather. ABC's World News this morning, right before Good Morning America tomorrow. I'm Joan London. How can you save money, and if you have it, where should you invest it? We'll find out tomorrow morning. Plus, Burt Reynolds talks about Clint Eastwood tomorrow on Good Morning America. Elie Wiesel was 14 years old when he entered Auschwitz concentration camp with his family in 1944. He survived the Holocaust. His mother, his father, and his younger sister did not. This past weekend, Elie Wiesel returned to Auschwitz accompanied by ABC News correspondent Peter Jennings for ceremonies marking the 40th anniversary of the liberation of the camp. During the course of their visit, Wiesel read for us a poem about Auschwitz that he wrote in 1979. Listen to the wind. Listen to the wind, for there is nothing else you can listen to. For this was the place where children became old and where old men had no children to console and they all died. Listen to the stones. For the stones themselves were broken as our hearts were broken. For this is the place of eternal night. In this place, people were abandoned, doomed. Mothers, children, grandparents, brothers, sisters. Imagine four million people lived and vanished overnight in this place. A whole nation could be built with four million people. There could be enough doctors, enough teachers, enough parents, enough children, enough princes, enough kings, enough merchants, enough dreamers, enough teachers to build a people. This is no cemetery. Those men and women and children, those old Jews, those Jewish children, those rabbis and their disciples, the singers of songs, the dreamers of dreams, they perished here and they have no cemetery. They don't even have a cemetery. We are their cemetery. That's our report for tonight. Good night.
inspectors from the National Transportation Safety Board began their second investigation of a Galaxy Airlines accident in just eight days. Ironically, this plane, along with an identical aircraft, also owned by Galaxy Airlines, was inspected just this past weekend by federal aviation officials, and both planes were given a clean bill of health. Though 110 of these aging Lockheed Electras are currently certified to fly, Galaxy Airlines owns only one other, and its operations have been temporarily suspended. But Galaxy officials say it might resume its flight schedule tomorrow, claiming the Electra is still the best plane in the skies. Jay Shadler, ABC News, Atlanta. Of that same aircraft, also owned by Galaxy, made a forced landing on a foam-covered runway. The plane had tr reported trouble with its landing gear. Officials said the plane's cargo included hazardous material, but no injuries were reported. Galaxy, which owned just three planes, grounded its two cargo planes after the Reno crash, and they were subsequently inspected by federal officials. In no uncertain terms, and in the strongest terms yet, Senate Republicans... Canards, aircraft with startling new designs and capabilities. We'll explore the disturbing world of the multiple personality. And we'll see what our local bars are doing to get customers in the door. You can call me Moyer, Paul Moyer. You can call this here program Eye on Hollywood. You know, while I'm trying some of this stuff on, why don't you take a look at this story about the latest in barroom antics? <laughs> a few years back, nightclubs were slapping their customers with all sorts of gimmicks to get them inside. Everything from foxy boxing to that dirty, dirty sport of mud wrestling. And then a renaissance of sorts to the not-so-high level of oil wrestling. Then Beefcake came on strong. Women went crazy for this new fan. It's uh, sexy and exciting, and um, it's really fun. But in the summer of 1984, no one really knows what the new nightclub attraction is going to be. And the owners, well, they're diving into deep competition for the drinking public's dollar. I'd like all you guys to come down and get us all wet. Wet. 